Hello, hello, welcome to this webinar for Your Horse magazine. My name is Andrew James, and with me is Matt Roberts, the Your Horse photographer. Hi. So, hopefully, we're going to talk to you a little bit today about um, photographing your beautiful horses. I mean, Matt, that's what you've pretty much been doing most of your life now, isn't it? Certainly, yeah, for most of my yeah. career, important. which is about 20, 22 or 23 years, I've been photographing horses either for Your Horse magazine or for a number of different people within the equestrian industry, individuals and um, businesses as well, clothing manufacturers, rug manufacturers, things like that. So it's quite a, quite a wide ranging thing. It's been about 60% of my um, time is taken up photographing horses. Okay. And uh, I mean, I, I do a lot of um, quite a lot of horse photography, but I'm I'm also very much an all-round photographer. Um, I've spent a long time working for photography magazines, although I'm now an independent um, photographer and journalist. So Matt and I are also working together, aren't we, on a yeah. on a, a, a horse photography course, which is why I think we've we've uh, come to do to do we this particular. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Put a hand up. So we're going to try and ask, answer some of your questions. Um, we've got some here that have already been sent in that we're going to go through. Um, one by one. Um, if you have any other questions, then I believe you can email those in. I That's think so, as far as I know, yes. And we'll get those and we'll try and answer those too. We'll do our best. We will. Shall we, shall we start with a question? Absolutely. Let's see what we've got. Let's find an interesting one. Um, right. Come on, sound excited. What's, what's the best way to take a picture of my horse jumping? Okay. Uh, mm. Go on then. Well, the first thing I would so I'm going to take notes. Can I take notes? Absolutely. You, you need them. <laughs> uh, what I would say is, uh, equipment aside, the first thing to do, and anyone who's been to, if we assume this is going to be uh, the cross-country phase of three-day event for a start, um, one of the beauty of photographing horse events in this country, for the most part, is as a member of the public, you can get almost as good of pictures, if not better sometimes. I think as better, better a lot of the time, time actually, yeah, absolutely. As, as what I was going to say, as the professionals who have maybe a press pass to be able to go the other side of the rope, but certainly in the slightly smaller events, I'm not talking about Burley or Barrington or Blenheim, things like that, you can usually have as good an access to the event as a professional. So, the first thing I would suggest is that you you pick a jump where you you can see the horse coming, give yourself plenty of time Plenty of time to see the horse approaching the jump. Plenty of time for the camera, the autofocus, to pick up the horse. So avoid jumps which have lots of trees around them, or you know they sometimes put um, sort of f uh, fir trees at the side of the jumps, or lots of lots of signage or things like that. Anything that can confuse the autofocus with the camera, and then and then as the horse is coming into the jump, frame it up in the camera and and. One of the best ways, one of the easiest ways to get a decent shot is from the side. So you, you can follow the horse in, follow it in, and over the jump. If ch More challenging is straight from the front. Uh, it's very easy to find yourself in a situation where you can't see the horse until the last minute, until it actually takes off. And for for cameras which don't have quite as quick autofocus, it takes them just a second or so to, to come up to speed. And you could end up with an out-of-focus picture. So yeah, that would be my suggestion. I think uh, yeah, you're absolutely. Right. I think that for a lot of people, though, they're not going to be using the same kind of equipment that, no, that we're agreed. using. So I think there's there are several things that you need to think about. One is that you need to be prepared and ready. So don't um, as, as the horse is coming towards the jump, you need to be already in position, knowing where you're going to stand and when you're going to press the shutter button as it comes up. Because if, you, if you're thinking, oh, right, I'll just lift the camera to my eye now, just as the horse is taking absolutely. off, you're going to miss the shot. So timing is absolutely critical. If, if, you are, if you're really not hugely into your photography, you can put it on auto. And actually, you know, auto these days on yeah. digital cameras, even on smaller digital cameras, uh, it is really good, isn't it, Matt? Yeah, absolutely. For the um, most part, it's, it, will, yeah. it will, unless the conditions are very... You know, if you've got lots of sky or lots of very dark background, for the yeah. most part, auto, yeah. auto auto focus and auto settings for the exposure will be more than adequate for for yeah for most situations. And, and because because the horse is is moving, so it's not a static. You 
we're not going to go. We're not going to get too kind of um, really boring, geeky photography people here. Well, but you need. You I need not. Well, yeah, right. But you do. Well, I'll try not to. But you do need a, what we call a fast shutter speed. A fast shutter speed means that you can freeze the motion, so you don't get um, either a camera shake or the or the horse moving, so it looks like a blur. So on your auto setting on your camera, you may have lots of different auto settings. Mm -hmm. Actually, um, you may have a sports mode, for example. Uh, if you have something like that, then it's worth switching to that Definitely. because that will automatically give you a faster shutter speed, and the camera will do some clever tricks inside it to allow you to um, yeah. to, to try and capture that that motion. So, and the other thing I think also with with particularly for uh, people with um, with smaller cameras, or when you're fo if you're photographing at an event, as Matt says, or even if you're a, you're a, you know. A, it's your own horse, yeah. and you're, you're somebody else is riding it, you're coming around, or you've given the camera to your mum, and you want her to get a picture of you. Is maybe get them to just to crouch down a little bit, yeah, because you can you can clear a bit of the clutter out if you're looking up to the sky a mm -hmm. little bit. Plus, of course, it, it makes you look as though you jump the horse is jumping higher. It gives it that, that sense of sense of scale, yes, doesn't it? Absolutely. Really? Um, I would say um, just going back to what I was saying about going to uh, assuming an event the. The, the cross country phase of an event. Um, the, the beauty of them in this country is there are masses of people going through, so you don't have to wait long. So you, within a day, within a day's eventing, you can have horse after horse after horse. And if you chose one jump or two jumps for five or six hours, you could probably just photograph horse after horse. By the end of that, hopefully, you will be quite tuned in to what the horses are doing. And, and it's a very, very good way of practicing. There's not many sports you could go and have that that facility to practice as hard as that within a, within a short space of time. So, um, right, let's have another look at another question. Okay. Um, we, this is an interesting one. Yeah. And I did notice as I walked into to, uh, Andrew's office here, uh, he's got a, a head cam, um, a thing called a GoPro. Do you mind if I... Yeah, yeah, bring it in. Which... I have as well. I don't know if you've, you've seen one of these. They're, they use them a lot on TV nowadays. Well, what, watch the Winter Olympics because yes. a lot of the oh, skiers yeah. have got them on their helmets as they're, yeah. as they're going down the slopes. This is probably the most well-known. It's from a company called GoPro. Um, there's also some, some sort of um, more ones that are more cylindrical. So they, they sit a little bit better on a helmet. A like a sort of almost cigar shape. Yeah, exactly. Um, and... Um, you can get some amazing. These are primarily good for video, I would say initially. Um, certainly with 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 riding, because with stills, using stills with one of these on a helmet, they move around quite a bit, and you can get quite a lot of blur. But with video, they're very good. But the question we had was, what's the best place to put? Sorry, where's the best place to put the head cam when I'm riding? Well, initially on your, on on your head. head. Yeah, the clues um, in the question, isn't it? These, they, a lot of these come with uh, sticky pads, which are incredibly sticky. Um, which, on a, a, a plastic riding helmet, like uh, I'm mountain bike, so I use one on a on a mountain bike helmet, which is fine. But on a lot of riding hats, as I found, riding um, crash hats, they don't stick particularly well. What you can get is a, an elasticated um, device that fits over the helmet and you can actually put it under the, the neck strap here so it's held on. And then with a bit of insulating tape around as well, it's pretty, you, it'd be bad luck if you lost it then. And, and then it's really just a case of, of maybe putting it on and trying some, trying some footage, having a look at it and going backwards and forwards until you get in the right position. Everyone will ride in a slightly different style. More, some people will ride much for the forward. Some people will ride sitting up. So you've just got to try and balance it. And the first time I actually did uh, some video with one of these was we sent uh, a lady off round a cross-country course as a practice. And I just literally had to guess. <laughs> Set it going. And she went and arrived back. And it wasn't until I got home I could actually check it. And fortunately, it worked out right. These later models, you can actually link in with a... Um, a smartphone, an iPhone, or or other smartphones, and you can actually see what you're getting through the camera live on your on your smartphone. So they're quite a bit easier it's to set up. Technology, it's amazing. amazing. It, it is amazing, is. but incredible quality from these. Um, in fact, I think the best one shoots. I can't remember what it's called. It's basically what the Hollywood are using for their films. Uh, something K. I can't remember, but uh, yeah, so incredible. Remember. But um, 
yeah, definitely worth having. Um, I think I think if, if for those of you who um, haven't got something like a GoPro but are thinking of using one so that you can yeah film yourself as you're going around a course and then just play it back afterwards to see where you went wrong or yeah. where you went right, hopefully, um, it's worth kind of knowing that actually they're incredibly simple to use. Um, however, and I don't know, Matt, whether you found this, but the battery life isn't yeah. very good with them. So just be aware of that. Make sure you have a spare and yeah. that you charge them up before you go out. It's uh, particularly bad on battery life if you link them with your smartphone because it uses a local Wi-Fi signal. So you log on as if you were logging onto a Wi-Fi signal at home or in an office. And as soon as you switch that on, it drains the battery quite quickly. So it's just really a quick check. Check it's in the right place. And off you go. Switch it off and, and set the camera going. Off you go. Mm. Um... Okay. Right. Can we yeah. go for another one? I think so. Um, we actually have got people um, we watching have. us. We need some questions from you. Ah. We've got we got this good list that's come up before, but we will run out of these questions. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to keep talking. Just keep making it. Uh, You'll be fine. Do I shoot away from the light or away... Sorry. Oh. Do I shoot away from the light? light? I think that's what we're saying is, do I shoot with the light behind me or the light behind the horse? Can I get, can I can I start jump, this one? I've got, because I've got, I've got a particular like of shooting into the light. Okay, it's um, shoot, it, shooting into the light. For example, isn't necessarily the um, best way of, if you like, making your life easy. However, you can get some really interesting and cool effects. But if you're starting out in photography and you're not that, then I would suggest that, yes, you shoot with the light over your shoulder so that the light is illuminating the, your, your, your horse or the horse and rider so that you can um, you know, get a good shot that, that way. However, if in the future you, you want to develop your photography, shooting with the light behind so it's backlighting it um, can call, create some really yeah, cool well, effects. But you, you know, remember, you've got, a bit, a bit oh, yeah, absolutely. Andrew and I happen to be uh, <laughs> we happen to meet up, which is actually part of the, part of the reason. We was that when here. you stole my picture? <laughs> when you stole my picture idea of, what, of the angle and everything right. that I got? Was that was that the time? Yeah, but it didn't make my fortune. <laughs> so um, we ended up sitting at the same jump. Albeit Andrew on one side of the uh, fence as a member of the public, and me with uh, mm. photographers on the other side. Not that it made any difference whatsoever, because it was literally a foot between where we were, and we both ended up doing a very similar shot, and, and it was fantastic. The, the horses were coming out of one of the lakes, and um, they were backlit. It wasn't a particularly bright day, but there was enough light that it was lighting them from behind slightly. And what we had was the splash of the water. As the horses came out of the water, so they were onto dry ground, they were still dragging the water with them and the splashes and droplets and, and the, the light just lit up the water. And, and we actually ended up mm. with a very similar picture. I think it was of Andrew Nicholson, yes. which we both emailed I each other. Was he, the, he was the winner, wasn't he? Mm. Was he? Oh, I can't remember. I'm sure he won. I've got such a bad memory. Yeah, no, I think he did. You oh, may not have won yeah. on that horse, but um, well, no, that's true. But we sort of emailed it to each other and realised we'd pretty much taken the same picture. But it, it's an example of using the light to to great effect. You you can compensate for the the backlighting because what it does is it if the lights from behind you it casts yes. your front into shadow. So you, you need to but you do need a camera that will allow you to do exactly. that. You, it, it's much more difficult with an automatic camera. We should say that at As this point. Uh, yes, because the camera on automatic will 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 try and work it all out for itself and, and that's when we were as we were saying earlier it can fall down and become a problem but you could end up for example with a with the horse completely dark and yeah. it's like almost silhouette yeah. which can look good but not always but going back to what i was saying earlier about the cross country and, and picking a jump where you give yourself ample opportunity to see the horse coming the horse over the jump and, and going away this is another one of those situations if you want to make your life as straightforward as possible we're, be we're keeping in mind that photographing horses is not the easiest thing in the world to do. If you want to keep it simple, keep the light behind you. Watch where your shadow is, though, because if you get close to the horse and, and the, 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 the sun or the light is low in the sky, the sun is low in the sky, you will get a shadow across them. So you've got to keep an eye on that. Um, but yes, if life, if keep life easy and keep the sun behind you, um, definitely. That's mm. my well, yeah, and I think the other thing is that um, a lot of people, particularly if you go the other way, and I know I'm banging on about going the other way, but if you do what Matt and I did at, at Burley and you're shooting into the into the light, you don't necessarily have to have 
um, the sun in the shot, and that's going to help. But if if you are shooting perhaps um, late evening, mm -hmm. um, you may you know your horse might be in the field just grazing, and the sun's going down and it looks absolutely gorgeous, and you get that beautiful rim lighting around the horse, and. Uh, when you look into the, when you when you point the camera into the light, you may get some flare on your um, coming into the lens. But when I say flare, it's sort of it's the light coming in and it sort of disperses it. And but and people kind of like trying to avoid that. Oh, flare is terrible. Not always. It can actually look really arty. And you know, particularly, I mean, horses are such beautiful mm. creatures, aren't they? Yeah. That it's worth trying to be arty with your images. It's worth trying to do something different. And the beauty, of course, with digital. Now, Matt and I are both old enough to remember the film days and to be brought up in the film days. In the film days, you, you obviously you, you you shot a roll of film and then you had to go off and have it processed, and it was all a very expensive business. But with digital. Actually, you can take, you can experiment. It's not costing you loads of money to experiment. So try, try yeah. these different things. That's the beauty of digital. It's just, just once you, once you've paid out for the camera and a memory card, really the the, the sky's the limit. You know, you can. And, and as I was going back, I keep going back to that cross country reference. But the fact that you can sit and take picture after picture after picture, of course, is another example. It's not going to cost you any money other than maybe paying to get in. And, and the practice you can get from that is, is invaluable. You know, you can just keep going. I, I did I did actually bring an example, some magazines with me, and I, I know I'm, this is a bit naff, but I'm going to hold it up to the camera. <laughs> but this is actually an example of a backlit shot, which is a front cover. Oh, sorry, the shine's terrible. Yeah, just shine. But you might, if you went back and found issue, where's the issue number? Um, uh, 378, October 2013. That is a backlit picture. Well, slightly backlit. It's quite subtle because it was it was quite soft lighting, but it was in the summer. Um, and it's it's used to reasonable effect. So, and, and if you just hold it up again, Matt, and then we've got, you know, as subtle as Matt says, but that subtle rim lighting around the edge of of the rider and the horse there. It, it, it just looks beautiful, and it, and it helps separate the horse and the rider from that background. So it can look really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I think there was a, a question there. Oh, yeah, was there? Yeah. Oh, let's have a look. Let's have a look. Let's have um, a look. Oh, okay. But let me go on to another question. How do you make the most of poor lighting? Uh, well, that's an interesting one. I've done a. I've actually been out on a shoot today, um, which has been. I think it's the uh, fifth. This is the fifth attempt of doing it because, well, I'm sure some of you, well, all of us can appreciate how bad the weather's been, um, and and we've had to cancel a couple of times because of the rain. And it still wasn't a particularly brilliant day today. But the cameras these days are incredible. They can compensate so much for. Uh, when it, when I actually missed the question, and I was, looking, I was looking at a photo we've been sent that we're going to right. critique it a little oh, bit. Oh, so sorry. So yeah. How do you make the most poor? Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, it, what I would say is that poor. There's, the, there's not really poor lighting anymore because the cameras are so good at compensating for. No, the there's, lack still, of there's still poor lighting. It's just the cameras are better. At well, yeah. than they used to be. It just gets darker and darker, but because the cameras can compensate more for the, the darker <laughs> conditions. Uh, I, I, well, we can carry on photographing in conditions that, say, ten years ago we'd have had to stop. Um, if if we're saying poor lighting, I think really we're, what we're saying is dark conditions because you can get poor lighting in the middle of summer when you've got the sun directly overhead and you've got Matt, someone's peak of their hat. Let's, be, let's face it though, now I mean, you know, working at the moment with the conditions that we've yeah. had recently, I don't. I mean, I actually had some nice lights on Sunday, Sunday but that's the first time for about a week or two. Yeah. So if you live in England, you have yeah. to know how to deal with poor lighting. Yeah. And, and certainly, um, the, the manufacturers of cameras are making them more capable of dealing with those those bad conditions, if yeah. you like. And um, there's so it, it's really just a case of using your camera, being aware of what you can do with it, and. Andrew was talking about shutter speeds earlier, things like that, and, and being um, picking and choosing when you do certain shots. Um, can I be? Can I be geeky? You go ahead. You're, okay. You can take that role. I'll be. I'll be geek person. In your in, if you have a digital SLR, for example, or even if you have a um, compact system camera or or a creative compact, by that I means some a, a, a camera that allows you to mess around with the controls rather than just put, um, just press a button and does everything for you. You have a setting that is known as ISO. Okay, I know that might not mean anything to you. What and, is that? Uh, ISO. Well, it actually stands for International Standards Organization. 
and Matt's gone to sleep. However, what ISO does, as stupid and dull as it sounds, is that it changes the sensitivity of your camera's sensor to the light. Yep. So in the olden days, we're going back to the olden days again, I've got grey hair, um, uh, in the olden days the film came with an ISO setting and it was it was sort of s set on that yep. and you couldn't change it from frame to frame. With a camera, digital camera now, you can change ISO from cap from picture to picture if the light changes, if you need to. So it, you can make your sensor more sensitive to the light so that um, if it's dull and overcast, you turn your ISO up and it allows you to take um, a picture in those conditions. The downside is it can make the photograph more noisy. Noisy means grainy, kind of, it can deteriorate the image. <laughs> Although, as Matt says, cameras are getting so good now that actually even at high ISOs, high sensitivity, you get you can still get a well, really good picture. Just before we started this, I was showing some pictures I've done recently to Andrew of uh, they just, yeah, I actually fell asleep at that well, point. Yeah, so, asleep, but, you know. but some portraits in an office, it's, uh, other things I do other than equestrian photography, and they're taken at higher, so, but they're more than more than good enough for, for, for what we need these days. So there's, it, the cameras are amazing. Mm -hmm. So they are. But, we need to move on because yeah. Let, let's move on. We've got we've got. I can't show you this picture. I don't know. There's no way I, that I know of that can I can show you this picture. Um, Drag it on. No, don't think so. Um, but I'm going to describe it. This is a. Uh, we've been sent a photograph by Andrea, and it's either Shimmer or Shimer. Shimer, possibly. Apologies, Andrea, if I've got your name wrong. Um, and I'm going to describe the picture to you. It's a. It's a picture of. Basically, the horse is right up close to the camera, almost sniffing the lens. Yeah. Um, a bit of snow in the background, and she wants, uh, you know, to give us give us some feedback on this picture. Now, the first thing I say is that what I'm seeing here is a picture that's full of character. Yes. There's a bit of humour to it, and I really like humour in, pho in photographs. It's nice and sharp. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's crisp. It's beautiful. The light's beautiful light that day. And it's a really good picture, Andrea. Really do. Don't, don't you it think is, so? It is a good picture. It's, it shows the horse has got character. It's actually both Andrea and I can see that it's taken uh, close up. It's taken. It's a fairly wide angle shot. So um, I'm sure you've seen pictures where horses' noses are quite big in frame, yeah. and they give you the impression that you're actually quite close to the horse. And, and it certainly gives that. And the horse has obviously got quite a lot of character. And it's just enjoying the moment. Um, it's uh, it's. Can you just bring it back up, Andrew? Sorry, I was looking. Are we getting to my know, questions? Yeah, now? I'm just checking. I'm I'm looking at He's looking ahead. Keep going. I would. Um, Andrew having said lots of nice things about it, and I I agree. Are with you what not going to critique? No, I'm going to critique it now. You are so miserable. Uh, if, I was, so miserable. if I was being really picky about it, I would say if it's got some wires across the sky, which is a bit unfortunate, and it's got a bit of a, it's got obviously a barn or a shed or something behind the horse's head, which is a shame. It's sort of, it's a little bit detracting, and then there's, it's quite close to a post and rail fence, which again is a little bit detracting. But he's got really cute whiskers. I know, I know, and it's a comedy picture, but I have to say, all those things considered that I've said, I think if I was if presented that as a, as a horse owner, I would be quite happy to have that as a, you know, it's a funny picture of a horse. It is a, it's a fun picture. It's, it's done. It's done well. But you're right. The background is a little bit cluttered, and isn't it? I would say, shoot, photographing. I should stop saying shooting, but photographing a horse on a wide-angle lens. Hmm. When I do it for for your horse or for for other clients, I always do say to people, it's not the most flattering shot of your horse, and it isn't. Horses naturally have. Big long noses. A wide angle lens has the effect of making that nose and that length of the nose. The good way of thinking about it is, ladies, I'm um, sure we have ladies watching this, you do not want to be photographed by a wide angle lens because it will distort your features. Yeah. So if you do have a longish nose, I'm sure none of you do, but if you do, it will exaggerate it. Yeah. So it's going to do exactly the same thing. But it's, it's only a picture that puts a smile on your face. For it sure. Does. It does. Okay. Right. We've got, so we've got another question. Yes. Okay. So, uh, Matt, um, this is from Jill Langridge. Right. Um, and the question we have is, she wants some advice on the best lens and camera body for indoor action shots. She has a Canon EOS 50D, but no fast lenses, apart from a nifty 50, she says. She, she knows what she's talking about. She's, okay. using, she's using geek terminology. She's like us now. Well, Andrew, unfortunately, is not blessed by 
uh, using Nikon. So he's sort of, he's a little bit hampered by camera. Well, I, I use the same there as Jill. There we go. So Andrew might be able to answer a little bit uh, more detailed about that. But going back to what Andrew was saying about ISO, if you, if you yes. remember, if you didn't fall asleep during that what? long bit. I thought that was really interesting. The, the nature of shooting indoors is it is darker than outdoors, unless it's nighttime, of course. Mm. So you have to use a higher ISO. So the downside is you can get this noise or grain. Um, but as we've said, cameras are so good these days that it becomes less of an issue. But what a lot of people find, and, and people will ask me about this, is um, their shots are blurry. Their shots aren't in focus. Um, it's fair to say... Uh, and it is one of these situations in photography where the more money you spend, the easier the job is going to be. And if your skills are there, maybe honed during a during the summer outside, horses jumping in nice bright sunshine, then the skills are there. But there is no compensation really for having equipment that, that deals with low light really well. Um, so where are you going with this? I'm going to the lens now because she's got the camera. So yes. Jill's got a camera, a camera, a 50D. I don't know much about that camera, but it's it's a it's a decent um, kind of enthusiast. Okay, and it's not it, it's not bad. I mean, I think that I think that the problem, Jill, that you've got. Can I pick, can I pick up on this as I'm mm, a bit more yeah. of a Canon user? Is the fact that you know the question you've got is is the best lens and camera body for indoor um, action shots? Well. For really impressive ISO performance, then you've got to spend some money and you've got to start going up in, in camera body. Uh, but that's, there's an absolutely no point doing that if you are not earning your living. There's no point getting something like an e, a, a, a Canon EOS 1DX, which costs something around £5,000 just for the body. Just for the body, I have a camera. I've got a camera, a 5D Mark III. I can't. I, I can't remember how much I paid for that. It's it's a fair few thousand pounds. Your 50D is absolutely fine. So as we said, turn the ISO up higher. Now your fifth, your nifty 50, your 50 mil is a brilliant little lens. I've actually got one here somewhere. I've put it away in my cupboard. But anyway, it's a brilliant little lens that will allow you to shoot wide open. So you need to set that as wide as you can, to, and you can go. Um, so that's the aperture. So the aperture. Yes. Yeah, sorry, I should say you can go. You can. You. I'm not going to go into it because it's it's a bit too technical right. for most. But if you but if you if you go back to that sports setting that Andrew yeah. was talking about earlier, which is one of the program settings, within the conditions, if, if you so if you set the camera to sports mode and then set the ISO as Andrew said up higher, yep. the camera will then have the facility to be able to pick a faster shutter speed and a wider aperture, as Andrew was saying, just on that lens. Yep. Um, which will then get you closer, if not all the way there, to being able to take pitch, more pictures inside more successfully. I would say though that yeah, you can. Yeah, you, you, there are going to always going to be some venues where it's just going to be almost impossible. There are some very big venues uh, where I would still go now, and I would find it quite difficult to get any decent pictures. Yeah, it's not. Uh, it's not always that easy, is it? It's not, and it does depend if they've got a lot of skylights, if they've got a lot of uh, a sort of maybe maybe um, not solid walls down the side. And a lot of daylight coming in can make a big difference. So if it's a sunny day outside, it can make a tremendous difference inside. But yes. But if you were if you were to buy another lens, um, you need to look at the the. Hang on, I'm getting confused. You see, I I buy these lenses, but I just use them. Andrew knows more about it because he has to write about them. I just I just well, pick them up and. and the, the only thing I was going to say about the nif about the your nif your nifty fifty, which is a fifty mil focal length, is is what Jill's asking us about. And the fact is, is that you can open it up to f 2.8. I'm assuming you have the 2.8 one. Well, that's the aperture thing that we were talking about. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, that's really, really dull for those people who are not that into their uh, photography. However, um, if you open it up to 2.8, you will suck as much light as is possible. So together with the ISO, together with the wide aperture, you'll get that. The downside to that is that while you will get a faster shutter speed, while you will, you will get a better chance of getting a picture, the sharpness, the through the image sharpness, which is called depth of field, if you are a dull photographer like us, um, will diminish. So it will there will be less sharpness. But I would rather have less 
kind of, if you like, depth of field through sharpness and get mm. the, the shutter yeah. speed higher than go the other way and end up with a really horribly blurry shot that yeah. doesn't work. Now, the only other thing that you could do that we haven't talked about, Matt, if you're indoors, depending on how big the um, you know the arena is that you're working in, you know is you say. could what well, you could use a slower shutter oh, speed yeah. and then you could what we call pan your camera. So you've got your your 50D and your 50 mil on, and you, you say you go for a f4, f5.6 aperture, and it gives you a shutter speed of maybe a 50th or a 30th or mm -hmm. something, which if you've got a normally handhold will mean that you will get probably a slightly blurry shot because you can't hold it steady enough. However, if you press your shutter as the horse moves past you and you move with it as you do it, you can get a really cool blurring effect where the horse is pretty is reasonably sharp and the whole background moves. It's just a nice little it, trick it, that you can pull off occasionally. It takes a bit of practice. It does. Uh, more often than not, shooting, shooting, photographing in a venue inside, uh, sometimes you have to fall back on on accepting that you're going to get something for effect rather than horse after horse after horse sharp over the same jump. So it may just be you have to fall back on different skills uh, and, and different effects. So if you were looking for something a little bit more creative, going down the line of what Andrew was saying. But one thing I would say is uh, if it's a venue where there's competition going on and there's other people and there's other horses and things, don't be tempted to use a flash. It's it's not a, you know, there are some horses that don't bother with flash at all, but it, 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 in general, I would say it's, it's probably not a particularly good idea. Okay. So hopefully that's a bit of help. Um, We've got another question. Yeah, another question from Emma Davies. Um, Matt, how do you take good flat work shots? Do you take lots to get one good one? Yes, he does, but he won't admit it, obviously. Uh, or is there a perfect time to take the shot? Yes. Um, yeah. So he's not laughing at my jokes. No, yeah. I feel really bad now. <laughs> no, I was. I was smiling behind you. Um, uh, yeah, I just take I just take two shots really, and I get the best one. No, I take lots of shots. To be fair, um, there were it's it's just um, the the my area of skill, if you like, is a photography. And although I've been photographing horses a long time, I wouldn't claim to have massive knowledge of. Uh, of, of sort of movements and what what is flattering to a horse. You know, I have my own opinion on it, and I, I, I have a fair idea of things, you know, dressage, um, different dressage paces, different dressage moves, things like that. But if we were to take a, an example of a lesson that is going to appear in your horse, I would uh, take a lot of pictures. It's not uncommon to have eight or 900 pictures for the writers to have to wade through to find the pictures they want. But they are linking up the words and the pictures, so they may want they may want something that's not quite correct. And if I was to just take the one picture where the horse's leg is in the right place, or what I consider to be in the right place, it might not be the right picture for for the feature. So, going back to the question, um, I take lots of pictures, and then afterwards I would choose uh, the the correct or what I would see as the correct leg position, the correct. The, the correct position of the person, and certainly, if, say for instance, a front cover picture, I would, I would take a sequence of pictures, and and anyone who, who watches horses, or rides horses, or knows horses, knows that they have, have paces. That, I mean, if they're cantering, for instance, they have times when the legs are in lovely positions. So I don't think I've got an example here. No, I haven't. They have when the legs are in a lovely position where the the horse is up at the front, and it sort of it looks proud and it looks it looks powerful, and then. The, Maybe half a second later, the legs have gone back under itself, and it looks like it's about to fall on its nose. And that would be within a sequence, and maybe I'd discount those ones straight away, but the ones where it's sort of proud and uphill and, and, and sort of picking up its feet uh, would, be the, would be the ones I'd go for. But um, within, a, within a dressage lesson set or dressage competition, uh, you can do the same. You can use the same technique, basically, to, to know what's coming and then just go through a sequence of pictures on the motor drive for the camera and then and then pick the right one. But it doesn't hurt to know to get your eye in either, to know when the, the, the legs are going to be in a certain position. And certainly the photographers who photograph dressage say all the time, they'll be looking at getting two or three pictures per movement and picking the best one from that. Okay. I think that's the answer to that question. Yeah, no, I think it's a good one. Um, there's another uh, question we got on Facebook, and um, this is somebody who wants your job, Matt. I okay. think. Uh, this is Lydia Rose Weir. She asks, mm -hmm. any tips on getting into the equine photography um, industry, right. basically? So she does. She wants your job. Yeah, basically, you need to get 
retire Matt, and then there'll be a vacancy, obviously. There we go. Your horse, mate. Um, well, uh, I uh, I got into photography initially by um, doing work experience. I, I did it as a hobby all through college. Um, although I didn't study photography at college, I, I was I did it. I studied agriculture at college, but I decided I wanted to be a photographer. I did some work experience with the company that the publishing company that owned your horse. And you know, sadly, I remember. You sadly, I, I think I may have met Andrew for the first time during those three days, and um, hundred years ago. Yeah, yeah. by being patient, I I ended up working for the company for twelve years. Um, he wouldn't go away, basically, is what he's saying. And he just hassled them until they said, "Oh, for God's sake, you're staying here. You might as well have the job." So they just I, felt sorry. I was cheap as well. Yeah, but I I didn't I didn't plan to be an equestrian photographer, and and in fact. I, I am. I, I do a lot of equestrian photography, but I do a lot of other things as well. So I'm. I'm definitely not just an equestrian photographer. And I would say it's. It's probably fair to say there aren't many people just making a living from equestrian photography. Most photographers will do other things as well, uh, and and that's a good thing as well because you bring what you do on, in a different area. You bring you bring to to work in other areas. So. Well, maybe one day, like I was saying, I'm doing portraiture. You, you maybe then photographing horses, and it, you can. It's it's cross. What's the word? I don't know. You can cross over. You. You, can cross over. Stop. You, stop. you can cross over. So, uh, but I would say is make good contacts. Uh, be um, ask the right questions. Don't. Uh, and get in the way, you know. People, you've, can, got, you've got to start with a portfolio as well, haven't you? So you've got, you've almost got to start by having, you, you know, you've got to go out and be doing yeah. it, and so talk to your local stables, see whether they, you know, any any of the people there want pictures. Yeah. You've almost got to be prepared to do something for nothing initially, yeah, in order for you to gain some experience and get yourself a portfolio to get that, and then you can start promoting it. Now we live in a we live in a day and age now with. Um, <laughs> You know, digital um, with Facebook and you know the internet in general, where you can put your images out there to a wide audience that was yes, not the true. case when you started. So you've got to you've got to use these vehicles to really promote to be to self promote yourself. There has never been a better chance for people like yourself starting out to, um, if you like, build your own profile and build your own brand. So if you're really dedicated about it, you've got to think about how you're going to do that. So the first, the first thing though is to start with just getting good at what you yeah. do. Because Perhaps. if you're not, if you're not good, you will, you know, you won't get anywhere. I'm sure you are good, but you need to practice. You need to do it, and you don't want to show everybody every picture you take. Edit, edit everything. If we showed. You every picture we take, we'd probably be slightly embarrassed because they're not all very good. Sometimes it doesn't work. You know, professionals get it wrong, don't we? It's just that's how it is. Yes, it does. It does. So you know, you you need to be able to um, self-edit, work out what's going on, and also don't just think that you know which is the best picture. Ask other people because we get an emotional connection to our pictures. Yeah. And um, and I think that's one of the big things is that if you are emotionally connected to something, you think that one's the best picture or that one is because it it meant more to you on the day. Actually, that may not be the case. It may be picture number ten that you've not even considered is the more commercial or whatever. That, 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 that is true. Those, that, it's an interesting point because, um, for instance, on the cover shoot, I was saying about leg position and things like that. I've been on cover shoots with uh, some of the writers from from your horse or for, with Imogen, the editor. And and we do have different opinions of what we think is is the right leg position for in a canter, and not all the time, but sometimes. And it, it it's interesting what different people will pick. And by doing lots of photography, lots of different horses, different venues, different situations, you just you you learn, you get an eye for it, you see what works, see what people like. It's not it's not necessarily about what you like. If you want to be commercially successful, to a certain extent, you have to. You have to do what the client wants. Um, after a while, you may start getting booked uh, because of a style you have. I think, but I, I would go back and say I wouldn't. Um, I wouldn't. If thinking about a career in equestrian photography, it's probably a bit of a stretch. I would say a, a career in photography with a bias towards equestrianism, if that's your passion, um, which I've been lucky enough to do. Um, but having different skills is invaluable. 
to as many different sugars. You start you coming on a course with us. Yeah, absolutely, the course with us would be a very good. <laughs> blatant, point. blatant plug, but good actually, you know, genuinely, we we we're, we're planning this. Yes, so, uh, you I know, think we need to. Know. Yeah, we need to make sure we're going to promote it. Yeah, well, we will be uh, well. We'll on we'll, Facebook. We'll we'll do it through Facebook, of course. Absolutely, Facebook and and and, and, um, and a website. That's how we will yeah. be doing that side of it. Okay, so that's really awesome. Shall uh, we? Should we take another one from yeah. uh, from yeah. the piece okay. of paper? You pick. You pick one. Uh, uh, oh, if the, oh, this is a nice one. Mm -hmm. This is a nice one. If there was no budget involved, what cameras would you recommend? Wow. Go on then. Um, well, actually. Uh, well, it it's like computers. Camera camera manufacturers are forever bringing out updated models of their cameras, and Nikon have, have just announced a replacement for their top of the range professional camera, which is currently a D4, and they've just brought out the D4s. Well, mm -hmm. I don't think it's out yet, but it will be soon. Um, I suppose if money was no object, I wouldn't I wouldn't say no to a D4s, but. And I'd go obviously for a Canon EOS 1DX. The 1DX, which which is the equivalent, and as uh, and they're as capable as each other. We we yes. use Nikon yeah. tend to joke about Canon, Canon, and, can and it matters not one job. Doesn't they are equally as capable uh, in the right hands, um, but I would. To be honest, I'd want two D4s to be honest because I use two cameras. You're greedy. You're greedy. I use two cameras so all the time. I have one on one shoulder, one on the other shoulder, and yeah. different lenses on them, so I can react. Because horses, things with horses happen quickly, so you need to. But it's not just about the camera. We we talked earlier about the lady who wanted to shoot indoors. It's very much about the lens as well. And um, I I have a I had a camera here, which I have a lens on. Which um, if if anyone was to put me on the spot and say what lens could you not manage without it? Would be that one. It's an 80 to 80 to 200 millimeter 2.8 lens, and I've probably been using it for the best part of 10 years. Um, and I I use it so much that when it broke once, I had to go out and buy a spare, which I now still have sitting on a shelf at home. Because if it breaks, I have nothing to fall back on, so I have to have two of them. Um, and it yeah, so it would be lovely to have a, a brand new kit of cameras, but I would have Nikon D4 S's. You'd have Canon mm -hmm. EOS 1DXs, I'd have three of them, I'm not just going to go for two, I mean, you know, you want one on each shoulder and you want one in the back, just in case it's everything fair. goes wrong. But it's fair to say there are always little other little cameras, you know, it's like the GoPro we were talking yeah. about earlier, they're very nice to have, they're great fun little cameras, they're really yeah. useful, but yeah, if you're just talking about cameras, that's what I'd have. On the, on the other end of that scale, maybe we should go for, if there was no budget, oh sorry, the other, if, oh, what yeah. would you do? Can you recommend? I'll, I'll buy on a budget. On a budget, yes. I, uh, that's a good question. Actually, mm -hmm. I meant to say this earlier when you, we were talking about the lady who wanted to photograph indoors. Yeah. Well, one thing I would say, if we went back eight or nine years, uh, digital cameras were very much in their infancy and were, had, they weren't as good as they are now, it's fair to say, I think you'd agree with that. Oh, totally. The, ca the cameras these days are amazing, and probably have been for five or six years. Um, yeah. So therefore, when anyone ever comes to me and says, what should I buy, and they've got money in their pocket, I would say buy second hand. Buy a camera that's been maybe mm -hmm. superseded once or even twice. I could, I could pick you a camera... I could. You're upsetting all the camera, I don't camera mind. manufacturers I don't mind. everywhere. Now. I buy a lot of my cameras second hand because, uh, well, as Andrew was saying, the Canon equivalent of the, the Nikon I would like is around about five thousand pounds. The Nikon is four and a half thousand pounds. I just can't justify spending that, even to buy the professional version I want to, which has been superseded by the D4, will cost me two thousand, two and a half thousand pounds for a second hand camera. So if you go to the sort of next models down or a little bit further down, so the more they call them prosumer cameras. So they're sort of I have I have one which is a smaller camera which I use for when I need to travel lighter. Um, and they're a bit cheaper. If you went for a second hand one of those, you might be able to buy one for four or five hundred pounds, which is maybe four or five years old. Fantastic autofocus, fantastic uh, facilities, and then you've got more money to put towards the lenses which you put on the front. Mm -hmm. And I would say, we cam digital cameras now have reached a point where they don't need to have more quality. They don't need. They the manufacturers are now adding things which are making people want to buy them more. They make me want to buy them sometimes. But if you don't want all those whistles and bells, 
a second-hand camera, three or four, four or five years old, will be a really good place to go. So I would say something like, if you want to write it down, a Nikon D200, a Nikon D300, a Nikon D300S, all of which I've had and I've used as, as second cameras. <coughs> and so the equivalent of Canons? Uh, well, you've got well, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of entry level Canon cameras that you, that, the, the, all, that are all good. But you, I, I think that you're almost going down the wrong route here because you don't necessarily have to have a digital SLR. I think you could look at well, now. You can look at compact system cameras. Now, compact system cameras are basically have lenses that you can change, so you can take them off and put another one on, just like a DSLR. But they are they are smaller. They're not. Um, and they're generally cheaper, but actually some of them aren't. But um, Fujifilm do some really good compact yeah, system cameras. True. Olympus do some really good cam um, uh, uh, CSEs, um, pen um, series. It, it, great stuff. Um, Sony, you know, there's a whole bunch of manufacturers out there that are producing really good cameras. They're fast autofocus. They're a little bit fiddly because when you miniaturize things, it, it takes, you know, it, you press, you've got one button that does three things. But you don't have to necessarily think about getting a digital SLR if you want to take good shots because they have good lenses with them and they have, as you said, all the bells and whistles. Now, I think Matt's advice about going secondhand is a really good one. But if you can afford to go mm. and buy yourself a new one, then then, you know, then why not? You know? What I would say, though, is um, if you can get a camera, whether it be an SLR, which would be what, what I use and, um, for the most part, Andrew would use, yeah. or if you go for one of the more compact system of cameras, I would try and go for one which has a viewfinder. It makes a big difference holding the camera to your eye. Yes. It's another way of bracing the camera. If you're holding a camera out in front of you, looking at the screen to take the picture, it's quite difficult to hold it steady and to frame it up. If you put it to your eye, you naturally move your head and camera together. And so, so some of them you can buy a little separate. A separate before before that goes but I would, I would sure definitely that. say that would be a, a, a stipulation, I would say, to get a camera which, ha which comes with a viewfinder, whether it be an SLR or, or a more of a compact system. We're, we're running out of time, I think, aren't we? Um, we're not there yet, but I just wanted to look at this. We have another picture sent in. Again, I'm sorry I can't show it to you, everybody, but it's sent in by uh, Becky Mitchell, whose partner Alan photographs horses at home and in competition and wants to know our opinion um, on, a, on, a, on an action shot that, that he sent it. I guess, is that Becky, do you think, on the horse? Uh, it right. could be. Okay. It looks like some tips. Nice, nicer day than it was today. Yeah, definitely. But what sorts of tips on capturing motion nicely? Well, what's it done nicely? I mean, you, you know, capturing motion, I guess, to, it, it effectively. So go on, go on, go on, Matt. Okay. You're, the, you're the master of critique. Um, Assassinate. Well, it's uh, it's it's sharp. Uh, yes. The lighting's not too bad. Well so exposed. Blue sky, well exposed. Yeah. Uh, if I'm honest, um, I'd have probably used, I'd have photographed it using a, a longer focal length. So if you have a, whether you have a, a zoom lens on your SLR or a zoom lens on your compact camera, um, Use the longer lens. So if, it, if the lens is say 35 to 70 or 35 to 135, go to 135 or 70. It's a more flattering focal length for the uh, for the for the horse and the rider. Um, it, it's uh, it, clearly Alan's used the right uh, a good shutter speed to, uh, and a camera, or he has worked out that the the exposure is right. Mm -hmm. um, there's not. It would be. It will be um, cut the feet unfair. off at the bottom. Yeah. That bothers me a little. Yeah, bit, the front, the now. front right Sorry. hoof is slightly cut off. Um, and and if I'm being perfectly honest, the leg positions, um, not not one. Say I would. It choose. looks a little ugly, doesn't it? The leg. Yeah. Position. If maybe a frame or two later, uh, the front left leg would have been pushing forward, looking like the horse is really, really working forward in trot. Um, but apart from that, well, there's a there's a bit of an ugly tower to one side, but I don't know what that is. But it's nice. You could have, I would have cropped that picture to be honest afterwards in in, in yeah some editing software just to avoid the the, the sort of ugly uh, what is it a mobile phone tower or something. I don't know what it is. But anyway, but apart from that, um, it's got a it's, ring dangling off it. Maybe you have dolphins coming. It's jumping. Oh, maybe they do. Um, uh, what's the sport where you throw the ball through the Horse, horse ball. Oh, okay. Yeah, it yeah, could, could be. be. Could yeah. be, actually, yeah. But just so, crop it, you're right, so just crop it. Just, just crop yeah, that it could out. be cropped out. Yeah. But apart from that, I think it's, it's a good effort, um, yeah, it but I would 
I would look to be using your camera on a longer focal length and do a sequence, do a motor-driven sequence or equivalent of a motor-driven sequence these days and, and pick the best frame when it comes out. Most cameras... But you don't, you, but you don't want to go just kind of banging your... You know, do you? You want to get the time that right well, as well. Two or three shots, surely, you know. Yeah, kind of, yeah, you yeah. Know. but, it, but if, you know, if you know where you... If you position yourself well and, you know, and as Andrew says, maybe I'm a little, little bit reliant on the motor drive these no, days. No, I'm sure you're not. But, uh, yes, if you can position yourself and know what leg positions are going to be, then... But it, it's not it's not a bad effort at all, I have to say. Um, okay, right. right. Here's, a, here's a really good question uh, for, for people uh, who've taken a really good shot um, of their picture, oh. of their horse. What's the ideal size for a picture in order for it to be blown up on canvas? Now, I see this a lot when I go around friends' houses. They've blown up their picture oh, and, they, and they put it on a really big canvas and it and the, and the quality yeah. deteriorates, isn't it? I mean, you need the, a file size that is big enough to, to blow to, do, to, a, you know, to, a, to, a, to a full size. Now, there is some, with canvases, it will forgive a little bit because obviously there, there's no texture and there's yeah. no grain. So you can get away with a reasonable amount. But obviously, if you're saving for a, for a, for a web, for example, mm -hmm. you're talking about something under one megabyte, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. 500 exactly. um, kilobytes or something like that. It's fine often for a, for a web image because you only need 600 pixels wide at you know, uh, the maximum. But if you're going to blow it up and put it big on the wall, it needs to be the biggest resolution that you can get from your camera. So make sure if you're shooting JPEG, which most of you will be, that your setting is fine JPEG. Mm -hmm. So that gives you the largest. And that, would, that, that megabyte size for the file will be dependent on the size of your camera, uh, on your camera specifically, but um, that's the order of the day. Just make sure you are you've got it set to the, the biggest, yeah. the largest JPEG set. But if you if you go to a, a decent printer as well, they'll be able to um, increase the size of the file before they print. It's not it's not a sort of um, a fix all, but to a degree you can enlarge the image up um, by adding information. Um, which will end up with a bigger picture, but it's it, as I said, it's not a fix-all. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, we do. So, uh, okay, so we've got about four or five minutes left. We, what else? We, we, we ought to say at this point we are. Well, I know we said it a couple of times, but we are running. Uh, we are um, running a, an equestrian photography course. Yes. Uh, it's likely to be in Lincolnshire. Well, it will well, be in Lincolnshire. Yes. Yes, it will be in Lincolnshire. Oh, is it Cambridgeshire? Is it Lincolnshire? Well, it's Lincolnshire, it Cambridgeshire, Cambridgeshire Northamptonshire. <laughs> it's a bit of a crossover. So you can tell we know a lot about. Uh, it. And it, you know, we're going to be running it uh, probably in April or May. Spr yeah, spring, certainly this spring. spring once the weather picks um, up a little bit. We'll be. Uh, you if you follow, if you look at my Facebook page, which is uh, Matthew Roberts Photographer, and yours is. Um, uh, uh, yes, yeah, so, yeah, Andrew James Media. You need to check up on uh, Facebook. We'll put, be putting some things about it on there. So. Um, and if you're interested, please and, and, and hopefully we'll be able to put, you know, the, the girls are let us put it up on the on the Your Horse website. As that well. would be so the best way. So that. if you're interested, give us a shout. But let's let, there's one good question on here. Um, okay, can I still take good images on my iPhone or compact ah. camera? What's the best way to do this? Now, obviously, a lot of people now they have smartphones. Yes, you can. Um, you can. They there are uh, the, the the huge benefit of having a smartphone which can take pictures is the fact you're going to take pictures. Uh, and if you didn't know whether you can get pictures, that doesn't really make sense. But as a as a as a human it's race, we're we're taking up for the end of an hour. We're, we're taking pictures more and more these days, which is great because we have these facilities to do it. The downside is they are not. You take a picture of you lot now. Hold on. The, so keep talking. The, the, the pictures, pictures, the 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 lenses that they put on these cameras Something are you know. quite wide angle. So they're not. We talked about the horse earlier, which is a shot on a wide angle lens. It. It's not the most flattering, um, and also the, the the cameras aren't responsive as much. So taking action photography is not particularly easy. And if you want to print it, I wouldn't yeah. recommend putting it on the canvas. Basically, it it's a, it's a good record of something funny happening or. It's a great for putting on Facebook, of course. Exactly. Yeah. So it, yeah. But if you want to do something, you know, I'm not going to put you off using them to record moments and record things happening. But at the end of the day, if you if you want to move into taking really good quality pictures of your horse or your friend's horses or just of yeah. the competition, you need to think about moving towards proper cameras. As, I, as Andrew rightly corrected me, not necessarily SLRs, compact systems. There's lots, lots of things available there which are an improvement on 
a built-in camera on a phone. Definitely. I think I think the thing about the iPhone is that you you know you can get nice shots with it or any, any phone. You know, Instagram. Instagram allows you to do a little bit of sort of simple yeah. processing, yeah. and they can look great. They can look great on your Facebook page. They can yeah. look great if you're just emailing it to somebody. It's and some of the of the uh, mobile phones now they do have quite a, a, a big file size. Yeah, yes, that's you can reason. print from them actually, but there is always um, some issue around quality and obviously functionality. It's definitely functionality. Going back to what I was saying about having a viewfinder and being able to put the camera to your eye. Obviously, you can't do that with a phone. We've got, about, we've got about a minute to right, go. Okay, well, well, are we, are we, are we got well, to the end of uh, this, or we've got any more questions? So if we haven't answered your question, then apologies. It's because Matt how do you talks make, too much. How do you make the horse feel at ease during a photo shoot? Basically, uh, you just have to go with the situation. If the horse is not, is not feeling it, you can't do it. It's one of the things we try... In, in the business we're in with magazines is trying to get across to people who don't understand horses. Very difficult to say to them, we couldn't do it today or we only had five minutes with the horse or ten minutes with the horse because the horse you have didn't to be want patient, to play ball. Patience, you? knowing the horse, knowing the person who you're taking photographs of with the horse, they know the horse, it, there's no substitute and just a bit of patience and being prepared to go back if it doesn't work the first time. So. Good luck with your photography. I think we've come to an end. I think we have, yeah. I think that's the hour up. So, yes, thank you for those who did um, watch uh, yeah. Two Idiots at the End of a Webcam. Good questions. Going on about geek stuff to you. So, yes, thank you very much for the questions. And maybe we'll do it again sometime. I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. Okay. That was good. All right, then. Take care. Bye. Bye.